Remember chemistry? Remember activation energy and a reaction? You need a certain amount of energy that's actually more than necessary for the reaction to take place, but just so the reaction will start. Well, it's shaped. Um, there was a graph of it that I always remember, and I don't remember any labels for it or anything. Um, but essentially, it looks like a hill. And the energy required to make this reaction happen, you know, as energy is building, it actually has to get up over this hump. And that's this, this difference here represents the activation energy needed to actually start the reaction over here. Now, please, my chemistry aficionados out there, please correct me. Help me remember exactly what that is. But that's the concept that I remember is activation energy. You need just a, a little bit more to get the thing rolling. And then it takes care of itself. And I'm sitting here working on a personal project, self-development, learning how to code, all that jazz. Um, and feeling a lack of activation energy. Some might call it a lack of motivation. I call it a lack of vision. It's not a lack of drive. It's a lack of vision. Because I have a dozen things I can build. I have a dozen different things I could be working on right now. And I just feel overwhelmed, frustrated. Like, uh, like I need, um, I need to sit down and plan the next project exactly because I'm coming back to things after moving and we've talked about this in a previous video you lose all that momentum you gotta build it back up okay where were we hmm so let's do that let's take inventory where are we what do we need to do all right um, a basic stack of, of technology that I'd be using involves quite a bit of tools quite a bit of technology. Um, and we're just gonna go through that today to give me a little primer on what I need to get done. Kind of paint a picture for you of where I'm going and what it takes to be um, kind of in my field and what I'm shooting for. So um, in the IT space, one would probably consider me a systems administrator, a systems analyst, a, A very junior programmer. No. No. <laughs> I'm not a developer. <laughs> what I'm shooting for is um, cloud engineer. Cloud engineer would be a very good title. Uh, infrastructure engineer. Um, anything along the lines of a DevOps engineer or an SRE later down the line would be great. But in order to get there, I have to add some tools to my tool belt. I have to add some skills. I need experience. And the best way to do that is to build applications that, um, that I want in my life. There's some things I'm working on for my family. Um, there's some things I'm doing for fun, for my own hobbies. Um, and it, like I just said, it's fun. I like putting together ideas, ha. Huh. But uh, I like programming. I like how creative it is, and I like how it's practical. So will I make a business out of it eventually? Sure. Will my, my um, gathering of skills net me a better career, better job eventually? Sure. But also, it's, it's a hobby. It's for fun. So let's take a little bit of inventory and see where we're at, okay? As far as operating systems go, I'm not worried. Really not worried. I use Linux on a daily basis. It's it's my favorite. And I've been using Windows since I could walk. So I'm not worried. And uh, I have plenty of iOS experience from a previous position. <laughs> so I, I'm not worried about that. As far as systems administration in a Linux environment, that's my weakest point. Because in a Windows environment, Active Directory, spinning up a, a DHCP, a DNS server, anything along those lines, cake, cake. It's been a few years since I was doing that professionally, but I have notes right in front of me, right behind you. Uh, it's not hard to figure that out. And any kind of hands-on experience I need to get back up to speed with Windows administration, I'll just 
spin up an EC2 instance that I have access to and, and play around with my own Active Directory and uh, DNS server. So, no problem there. With Linux, though, I, I know my way around. I know how to find the resources I need to learn what I have to do. Um, but I'm working my way through a, um, a systems administration handbook, um, different tutorials, I guess you could call them that. It's more of like group permissions and networking tricks that you can do in the CLI. So I, I've got some ways to go on that, but I'm not worried because <laughs> that's the bread and butter. You're always doing something from the command line. You're always dealing with operating systems. Um, Docker. Docker is useful. I don't know what to say about Docker. Um, I think it's nifty. <laughs> Making a Docker file and then, then you uh, launch that, spin up an instance based on that Docker file is just fun. You're like, wow, all that's contained in a, a little text file that you run. And um, I don't have any experience with Docker Compose, but uh, or Docker Swarm for that matter, but that's where K8s comes in. Uh, Kubernetes. Kubernetes? I don't know. I mean, when you're writing it in the CLI, it's kubectl or um, um, EKS control CTL. It, I learned that that was control months after I was using that, so I just call it CTL now. It's kubectl, not kube control. I, I don't know. Sue me. <laughs> K8s is also nifty, but... Uh, when I use that word for Docker, it, it more means, it means like cool and cute combined. K8s is a beast. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> and I have, uh, I've set up deployments and ingress with it and I'm, I'm very fascinated by it. But uh, none of my projects are in a place where it needs that orchestration right now. Um, definitely something I'll come back to, definitely something that in my job market I'm going to have to get better at, but I'm not afraid of it. If you sit me in front of a YAML file, you need me to um, pull up different namespaces and clusters and figure out what's going on and in what and debug something, I'll find my way through it. That's all i got to say about k <laughs> It's powerful. Um... CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment. I started my journey there with uh, AWS's code pipeline, code build, and um, whoa, code deploy. That's the third one. They're the trifecta. And <laughs> for that project, it, uh, it was appropriate at that workplace. Um, I could use it now for some of my projects, sure. I mean, they are hosted on AWS, but... I want something a little more industry standard, something with uh, different functionality that's offered by that trifecta. So um, my most recent project was using GitHub Actions, and that's linked to an S3 bucket there for a static site. Um, I'm very impressed by it. It seems small and powerful. Nifty comes to mind again. Uh, it seems comprehensive as well. You can do pretty much anything with it, uh, like all CICD, right? But um, yeah, maybe one more project will be using that, but I need to transition over into Jenkins, which is pretty much industry standard. Um, so for one of the things I'm looking to build in the near future, I am going to look at hosting Jenkins. I want to know if this is possible, right? Can I host it as a Lambda service, you know, serverless. So once a repo is updated, can that trigger this Lambda server to spin up and then Jenkins comes online, does its thing, and then goes back to sleep? I don't know. Does does a, a CI C D server need to be always listening? Like always on? Cause I was just gonna throw it on an EC2. We'll see. Um uh -huh. I've, I've played around with Jenkins in the past. It, I don't want to deal with Groovy. Maybe I'm lazy. Maybe I'm making excuses. I just, 
I got enough stuff here I need to work on. There's enough stuff here that I'm I'm looking to build. I just another thing to learn to master is a strong word, but okay, here we go. And I like learning. I like growing my mind, my skill set, but it's just a lot, man. It's a lot. Can I just stick with GitHub Actions? Of course. Of course. Should I go back to the trifecta? Sure, sure. But Jenkins is pretty widely used, and it's open source, which I really like. Um, yeah, there's really no negatives. It just, just being lazy. And then, um, so with cloud stuff, right? I'm all AWS. I'm just all in there. I, I have some Azure experience. Yeah, I have zero GCP experience. And don't care. It's a great platform for, for big data stuff. It's great. I just, that's okay. Um, and Azure's fine. I, I've got a bone to pick with Microsoft. It's, it's nothing major. It's just like, you, you notice little things that cause headaches sometimes when dealing with their, their software. The current employment I have, we deal with SharePoint a lot. And it's fine. It's fine. It works. But it, I'm eh. <laughs> just like, oh, it's a, a Microsoft shop. And I go, I, maybe I'll look elsewhere <laughs> for my next job. <laughs> Nothing against Microsoft. I just, yeah. So I'm all in on AWS right now. And it's great. When I started, I was clicking around the console to spin everything up to to manage our resources to get anything done and so in the last what was that six months sometime in the last year um i learned terraform am i the best at terraform no <laughs> do i have it mastered definitely not but holy cannoli it's one of my favorite tools right now it's it's so powerful <laughs> you you type something out just imagine notepad for anyone tech illiterate out there, you just write a notepad thing out. And then you say, hey, Terraform, do your thing. And Terraform goes, I made all this stuff in the notepad. Are you proud of me yet? <laughs> yes, Terraform. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> it's so cool. And then when you're done with all that, because you just made a bunch of resources, right? Then you type, hey, Terraform, can you kill those things? And Terraform goes... I got you. <laughs> Take some math. <laughs> and they're gone. And zero charges are posted to your AWS account because those resources are torn down. Oh my god. If if you've ever spent any time in the cloud and and done cloud work at all, clicking around the console can be a bit of a headache. Just a little, just a little, little bit of a headache. And <laughs> You, you introduce a tool like Terraform and you, you just, all your headaches go away. If you can figure out all of the different configuration pieces you need, then you spend a little extra time right now, every little piece, okay? So for instance, with a, with a VPC, that's just a network, okay? You set up the network. You need um, your routing tables. You need... Um, your, your access control lists, whatever is involved with the network you're setting up. You need all of that in Terraform. And that will bring me to my next point. Uh, but once it's written down, it just makes it immediately. You know, I mean, within one to 120 seconds, but it just makes it. And that is, whoo, mm, maybe my favorite tool right now. Maybe. Um, so the next point that I was going to make that I just alluded to is to know Terraform. You have to know your cloud resources. You have to know your cloud tech. You have to know what's available, what it does, how they work together, how, like we were talking about VPCs and networking, right? So you have to understand networking and subnets and routing tables just to put that in the Terraform. And you don't just have to know the networking. Oh, you can't see my hand. <laughs> you don't just have to know the networking, but you have to know the cloud stuff that contains the networking or the capabilities therein, right? 
So yes, learning Terraform is good, but you're not going to be able to do that until you learn the cloud. And you're not going to be able to do that in its entirety until you know operating systems and networking and HTTP requests and how the internet works in general. And so your base knowledge needs to be there, which I'm not worried about because I spent that time working on it. And there's always something more to learn. I'm far from an expert. Far. But I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> I know enough how to, to fix the problems that I cause. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so, let's see. Ansible. Ansible is great for configuration management, but I don't see how it fits into any of my projects. I, I don't have resources right now that need that kind of configuration management. Uh, I don't have EC2s that are online all the time. Uh, I don't know. And, and I'm, I'm struggling to find a use case in today's job market. So as a tool for systems administrators, Ansible, awesome. Awesome. You, you don't have to actually log into your physical devices. They're on-prem. Okay, you SSH into them with Ansible, and you can update your routers. You can you can do so many cool things with this tool. But where does it fit into my learning journey? Where does it fit into the things I'm building? I don't know because I'd have K8s looking looking at my clusters, running uh, all the different programs. Awesome. I'd have Terraform. Spinning up new instances as I need them, tearing them down. Uh, K8 is working on any kind of uh, failure recovery. So, and if it's not, there's different services in Amazon web services that could do the same thing. When am I going to need to update a server? Why wouldn't I just spin up a new one? Let's see, I don't know. So, there's there's some stuff that I need to learn. Great. And if I have to learn Ansible, great. It'll be a great learning journey. I just, it's another thing, like the, the Jenkins groovy thing. And uh, I got enough on my plate right now. So we're just pushing it over to that place. Uh, databases, databases. It always comes back to databases, right? You have to store stuff, be able to retrieve stuff, manipulate data. SQL. SQL is great. It's surprisingly powerful and fun to use. You type a few sentences and uh, you get a bunch of stuff back for it if you typed it correctly. Uh, and I started with MySQL. And it was great. It was good. And lately I've been using uh, Microsoft SQL Server. And it's okay. It's a little different. I've learned a few things. Um, the syntax is a little different, as it always is. I've been trying to get access to talk to Excel <sighs> successfully at work the past uh, three months, and it, it's been fine. They they do good stuff together, but um, sometimes there's just little translation errors between the programs. Uh, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, there was a stack overflow I was looking up because I... Like, the data wouldn't populate in Excel when you were uh, drawing a query from the Access database. Awesome. Uh, so what's going on? And something along the lines of versioning. I don't quite understand SQL uh, and its labels and versioning well enough to explain this. But basically, Access was using SQL 89. Excel was using SQL 92. Is, is that like... A, a UTF kind of thing, <laughs> you know, where, where it's just different encodings, or is it versioning? I don't know. But the like statement in my SQL query would not translate into Excel. You go into the access database, you open up the query, and you're like, run it, and all the data populates. Okay, great. And then you go to Excel, <laughs> and you're like, hey, use this query from the access database. Give me all the data in one of your spreadsheets. And it goes, I have no idea what that SQL says. Okay, I found a workaround and I learned some more. Um, love my SQL. SQL Lite looks so powerful for what it is. I, I read an article recently about how it's not just a, a fill-in database, you know, and they 
they talked about its capabilities and I believe it's contained in the app that you're writing too. Like you don't need another instance running with a database on it. You just have your web server and say you write in your back end in Django. SQLite is contained in the Django app, maybe. We'll come to that. Uh, so that's kind of neat. Wondering how I'll implement that if I go the SQLite route for one of the projects. We'll see. But what I'm, what I'm really fascinated with for production level uh, projects that I'm working on is PostgreSQL. Because I just see job postings for it everywhere. It seems to be like one of the de facto SQL databases that people use in, uh, in production. So, and it has an elephant as its uh, logo. So, I mean, what more do you need? Go with Postgres. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. There's, a, uh, there's not a very steep learning curve there for me because I have SQL in my background. It's great. It's, a, it's powerful. It's good stuff. So uh, that brings me to Django, brings me to backend stuff. I'm building things, right? Actually doing the programming to make the computer do something, right? <laughs> or have it hosted on the web and have something happen uh, to make an API, to build a nice little Hello World program, whatever it is, whatever it is. I'm going with Django because batteries included, my friend. Batteries included. If I later need more functionality in whatever regard, it's there. It's there. It comes with it. I don't have to look up what library or function thing that I need. It's, it's batteries included. So, <laughs> give me it. <laughs> Does that mean it runs heavier than something like Flask or uh, Fast API? Sure, sure. Could I get something out of the box uh, faster, better, or more appropriate to the projects with something like Node or or Laravel? Maybe. Maybe. But I don't know PHP. And my JavaScript is TypeScript. And it's atrocious. So... <laughs> I... It's, it's not really that different from any other programming language, but I learned TypeScript in September. It's February 1, roughly. Uh, so I don't know I should be diving into a um, JavaScript or TypeScript-based backend. I have years of experience with Python. Stick with what you know. I'm going to have enough trouble building what I have to build I like how I phrase that, by the way. It's not what I want to build, it's what I have to build. It's like a duty to myself and my family. I, I like that. Um, just stick with what you know. And Django works. Batteries included. Uh, apparently it's easier to learn than a few other things. I learned it. Learned it. That's a funny phrase. Because it's like, what does that mean? Did you read a textbook? Did you build something? Did you... Um, that was when I started my IT studies. I was working help desk and, you know, just trying to upskill, right? And I had no idea what a framework was or backend or anything. I just knew I like Python. Um, how do you program in Python or whatever? And Django came up. I was like, let's do a Django textbook and work through all the exercises. I had no idea what I was building or doing, but I worked through it and produced some cool things. Rango with Django. Is that what it was, I think? It was fun. There's a cowboy on the cover. Hee-haw. Uh, <laughs> and so that was a few years ago, right? And then you spend a few years not doing anything in Django. Um, at a previous workplace, I used uh, Spring Boot. And that was fun. I wrote a monitoring app. That got used in production. Never crashed once. Yeah! <laughs> uh, that was fun. Taught me about APIs and whatnot. Um, I actually understood what a back-end framework was at that time. Um, and it was good. Spring Boot, it's heavily used in industry, sure. 
but it felt like there's too many hoops to jump through. Um, I don't know what the right word is. I'm gonna use the wrong programming term for this. It felt very verbose. Maybe I'm using that term wrong, but you have to write a lot of stuff to make stuff happen. <laughs> different security credential stuff for authentication. That's like six different files. What the? Fine, that's not terrible. It's just like, why? Why? And, and then you learn why and it makes sense, but it's just all over the place. And we had configuration files that, you know, there's a reason they're split the way they are. Sure. But why aren't they all conglomerated into one configuration file? Well, the senior dev said it's easier to read. I said it's messy. <laughs> I'm not employed there anymore. Um, it wasn't for that reason. But um, yeah, Spring Boot's fine. I just, that's okay. Am I going to use Maven or Gradle? Hmm. Nah, that's okay. I'll just go with Django. So, uh, with my confusion on SQLite earlier, there's things I need to learn for how this functions. And uh, how exactly... I mean, obviously, you just make a new app in Django, and it's packaged right in there. Um, but how do microservices work with that? I don't know. If it's all contained in the same Django program, is that considered monolithic? Can I run different apps in the Django program on different instances, like a microservice? I don't know. <laughs> and yes, I'm choosing this because of familiarity and it's fun and I'm gonna be dealing with data and customer facing stuff and uh, Learning curve is low, authentication is easy, batteries included. Uh, these are bridges to cross going forward. Um, where does that leave us? So, as you can see, the tech stack is quite large. And I have a decent handle on the fundamentals, on everything we mentioned somewhat. I mean, I feel confident but when you go into an interview, first of all, never lie. Don't BS. Don't, just don't lie about anything. Talk your way through problems. They want to hear how you're thinking. Sure. But when you go into an interview, they know all the stuff. Uh, hypothetically, right? You may not know all the stuff. So not knowing what you don't know... <laughs> can be a little intimidating. Uh, and that's why I like to just focus on, on what I'm working on or, or problems I've encountered and how I've overcome them. Because I'm not gonna wow someone with my super duper technical analyses or understanding of things, but I can explain how networking failed in this regard and the HTTP request was rejected and how I solved that. And, all kinds of fun stuff. You know how fun it is to bring down production for an entire factory because you messed up an access control list or a routing table and the whole business shuts down for about five minutes while you're scrambling to figure out what you just did wrong? Looking back, awesome memory. So fun. <laughs> Actually, figuring that out, how to fix it again. <laughs> Thank God it was a short outage. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't brick the company for longer than five minutes. <laughs> but in those moments, you're, you're building experience. You're building an experience that you can share with people. And um, that, that is what I think is valuable. Because all this technical know-how, all the, the theory and understanding all the terms and all of that can be Googled. That can be looked up. Understanding how they work together, understanding what they do and the systems they're a part of and the systems around them and how all that's bridged together, that's important. You need to know that. But if someone, a recent interview I had in the last year, right, they, they mentioned some acronym or something. 
And they're like, oh, what's your experience with rubber duckies? You know, I don't remember the acronym. It was a while ago. But <laughs> they're like, rubber duckies? I don't know I've ever encountered a rubber ducky. And they're like, oh, okay. And it, But I asked a qualifying question afterwards. I was like, is that similar to, to LDAP, to like Active Directory something? or Because it was, it was something to do with Microsoft things. And so I just asked, like, is that related to this? I've just never heard that term. And, and then the interview continued. And uh, yeah, it's whatever those little nuances is are of, of the industry, I put very little value on it. Like another question they asked was like, what do you call it when you boot over the network? <laughs> right? And it had been like two, three years since I'd done a pixie boot. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, like network boot? I don't know, like you booted over the network, right? <laughs> and uh, they weren't impressed with that, right? So <laughs> later, I was I was reading something. Um, oh, I was I was studying Active Directory stuff. That's right. And and they were talking about booting things over the network. Pxe, and P Pixie boot, Pixie boot. We used to we used to do that all the time at that systems administrator job. That was like. That was the bread and butter of thin clients. That was the any kind of debug for specific situations. You pixie booted it to, oh my god! And so in an interview, you just don't. It's a stressful environment. You don't think of certain things. <laughs> and so um, I guess what I'm saying is, the tech stack I just described. I want to be so good at it. I don't have to be a master of each of them but so good at it that when you get into that stressful environment, you're just relaxed. And they're like, whoa, man, in K8s with this fancy ingress thing, what would you do when it breaks? And you just go, hey, well, I have experience with K8s ingress, and this is what I would do to look at it. Even if what they asked you to do was turn this pen into a server, which makes no sense with a K8s question, but deal with it. So all that said, I feel a little better. I feel less frustrated. Less like that uh, activation energy is eluding me. And uh, tomorrow, on my lunch break, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to look at this list of projects and pick the first one. And make it. Not on lunch. But uh, the process of that will just include writing out the necessary infrastructure for it. Simple enough, right? All you got to do is figure out what's it built on. Well, we covered that. It's Django. Great. Um, where does it sit? Is it on an EC2 instance? Is it uh, serverless? Or, like, How do you want it? Is it just an API? Does it produce a single page application? What do you want? So where's it sitting? That's important. Um, and then... What kind of CICD, I guess, would be the next question? Because I'm going to be updating it regularly, right? It, you don't sit down and make something in one day. <laughs> okay? You're going to put that in a repo so that you have version control and safety. <laughs> because Lord knows I have kids, and this screen already has a, like, a nice artifact right in the middle of it. <laughs> And who knows where this laptop's going. So you keep your code base updated in a repo. And that repo should probably also be monitored by a CICD tool so that you can keep wherever the program is located up to date. So that's what I'll be doing on lunch. Where's it sitting? How's CICD organized? Probably GitHub Actions again. That'll be a good challenge because my only GHA right now is just keeping an S3 bucket updated for a static site, which is good. That's good practice. But how does it work for EC2 instances? How complicated does that get when I do test environments? And what kind of deployment do I want? Do I want blue-green or canary or uh, just post a thing on the website that says back in five minutes, shut it down, update, and then restart? We'll see. Yeah, I'm gonna look into that Jenkins on uh, on Lambda. Actually, that that just sounds cool. <laughs> so, 
your repo would have to send some kind of trigger. Like you'd, you'd update a branch of the repo and it would send a trigger to the Lambda function. And the Lambda would spin up and, well, it's not a Lambda function, it's serverless, whatever. Um, and it spins up, it grabs the stuff in the repo, deposits it to where it needs to go. It goes, hey, you got anything else? I'm going back to bed. And it goes back to bed. I, it just sounds cool uh, to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm jumping on the serverless hype train. But uh, that is the end of my work night. And I'm really glad I got to share this with you. Talking it out actually kind of helped me work through it. Even if it wasn't the most entertaining for you, I really appreciate your time here tonight. And I hope you have a good week. <laughs> Night.